Hi, I'm Nicole Dyer from ABC Gold Coast and the proud ambassador of Gold Coast Open House. We hope you enjoy this recording from our 2022 Open House Talks program. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Gold Coast Open House 2022. My name is Jemima Rosemary, and I'm excited to be introducing the fourth night of our Open House Talks. Nowhere to grow, designing green spaces for a towering city. Before we start, and in the spirit of reconciliation, Gold Coast Open House acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. In the eighth year of the Gold Coast Open House program, we are delighted to continue to engage the general public in dialogue with architects through the promotion of contemporary and historical architecture and design in our city. Our goal is to communicate the process of placemaking and highlight the range of professionals involved in the creation of amazing spaces, places and buildings within our incredible city of the Gold Coast, some of which you will hear from tonight. We are a not-for-profit organisation and rely solely on volunteers and sponsors. So please support the Gold Coast Open House by volunteering and sharing your experience on social media and with friends. Before I introduce our moderator and in the event of emergency, Please follow the exit signs or our HODA staff, and please switch your mobiles to silent. So we are pleased to introduce Dr. Rosemary Kennedy as tonight's conversation leader. Not only is Rosie been instrumental in leading this year's Open House program as our chair, she's also the director of Subtropical Cities Consultancy and Mulder and Kennedy Architects. She undertook a pre-COVID fellowship in Southeast Asian megacities, Hong Kong, Wanzhou, Bangkok and Singapore to study the motivations and methods of the visionary architects behind the few exceptional high-rise apartment buildings that break the mould of the standard developer solution. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosie Kennedy. Thank you, Jemima. And welcome everyone, great to see so many faces here tonight. Um, our topic tonight is nowhere to grow, designing green spaces in a towering city. From Elkhorn to Pine, Staghorn to no Norfolk, our surface paradise avenues and streets are named for striking trees and rainforest, rainforest plants. But as taller and taller towers squeeze onto smaller and smaller sites, are we designing spaces that allow them to grow? What is paradise without its trees? Will the Gold Coast become just another hot and heartless concrete jungle? In this open house talk session, we're joined by a group of panellists who have seen and been part of the Gold Coast's evolution into a high-rise beachfront city. Together, they'll discuss why we need to pay attention to space for life on the streets and how we can do it. Let's meet our panellists. Kate Rogers. Kate's an urban planner. So far, her career has taken her to two global engineering firms and six local governments in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Her project, the Mang Mangir? Mang Mungaray, sorry, Mungaray Growth Centre Concept Plan was a finalist in the Year of the Built Environment Awards in New Zealand. And she also won a Planning Institute of Australia National Award for her work on From Plan to Place for Newstead River Park. Kate, you're now working at Gold Coast, uh, City of Gold Coast. What's your main role there? Yeah, thanks, Rosemary. Thank you for the introduction and thanks all for coming tonight. Um, it's good to see some friendly faces in the crowd. Um, yeah, my role is I'm the coordinator of the urban design team within the Office of Architecture and Heritage. Um, so I've, I've inherited um, a wonderful study called the Urban Tree Canopy Study. And although I wasn't at council when that report was created, 
I am now, I guess, the custodian of preparing the city's first ever urban greening action plan. Thanks, Kay. We'll hear a bit more about that soon. Next, we have um, Jared McCormick, who co-founded 8LA Landscape Architecture uh, in 2019, following 25 years of practice in both public and private consultancies. He was recently appointed to Brisbane City Council's independent independent design advisory panel. He's passionate about public art and sits on the Regional Arts Development Fund. Jared, Gold Coast landscapes and active transport are your thing. Can you tell us a bit more about how your work combines these? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. I guess um, trees are a big part of my business and what I do as a landscape architect, they're sort of part of my palette. And I've been fortunate enough to work on the Gold Coast for quite a few years. And I guess as a landscape architect, we deal in the public spaces in the public realm. We design the settings for building and we design the, the spaces for people. And we've been fortunate enough to work at a very high level on some strategic projects like landscape character study for the city and apply some of those ideas to local projects. So in the middle of surface, we've worked on, say, the Cabell Mall Master Plan, Gold Coast Light Rail Stage 1, uh, the Surface Paradise uh, Master Plan for the uh, riverfront parklands, and we've done Green Bridges studies uh, for the city, currently doing a, a study for how people move through the city. A water-based city creates lots of barriers to movement, so the Green Bridges study looks at how we can connect people together, particularly in a growing city. So we often face the challenges of how we can fit trees into this landscape and how we maintain trees. So I'm keen to talk about that a little bit further. And I guess trees, as I said, as a part of our palette that we deal with, they provide the structure to a landscape architect. They provide the canopy. They provide the shade, the microclimate, the setting. We, we might get yeah. into that a little bit later. I'm sorry, I get <laughs> carried away. <mate. laughs> Thanks, Jared. Um, Greg Forgan Smith is on our panel. Greg established Forgan Smith Architects at the Gold Coast in 1986, and since then his practice has designed significant commercial projects in Australasia, China, and the Middle East. Greg. You were instrumental in establishing the City of Gold Coast Council's Urban Design Advisory Board in 1995, the first in Queensland. So does this or an equivalent still exist? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, and the reason that I got hyperactive and I didn't have grey hair was uh, because the two councils we had at the time were just amalgamating. and. Um, the mayor of that council was going to be, it looked like the mayor of, it was Albert, and Albert didn't have any connection with Surface Paradise, and it was more interested in infrastructure joining it up to Brisbane, and I thought it was probably timely to bring on the subject of um, the, raising the awareness of um, complexities of building cities, I guess. And, and trying to, to see it as a more collaborative approach to producing cities and architecture. People talk about architecture and you see boundaries of buildings and houses and that and it stops there. But if you want to do a, la a city and consider all the complexities of a city, it, transportation, sewerage, landscape, everything, you need to have something, some cell in council that sees the bigger vision and, and get everyone to contribute to it because an architect's role from my perspective, is very narrow, and, and we have to work within guidelines that are established by so many other players. Meanwhile, um, an architect's skill is as an integrator, and that's where that whole thing falls into place in terms of um, seeing the city as a, a complex system, so it seems very apt. Um, now I'd like to introduce John Punch, OAM. John is a recently retired solicitor having practised for more than 50 years on the Gold Coast at his firm SPG Lawyers uh, in a full range of real estate matters, including several hundred large residential tourism building developments. He's currently a life member and a board member of uh, Destination Gold Coast. 
John, what are some of the other um, memorable local organisations or initiatives that you've been involved in? Right, well, uh, Rosemary, um, Gold Coast tourism or destination Gold Coast uh, arose out of people in the tourism industry needing some representation. But before that, I was on the board of, Gold, of Surf of Paradise Chamber of Commerce and we had a big hand in making certain that the greening of Surfers Paradise was undertaken back in the 1960s and 70s uh, with the beachfront needing beautification, uh, the commencement of the Cavill Mall, those types of, uh, of arrangements. And uh, uh, we also, uh, I also had a hand in Gold Coast Development Association which oversaw the connection of the developers to the needs of the city. Um, so that was a, a, a base that I worked from and went on to help with Gold Coast Tourism, Destination Gold Coast, which today represents a, uh, uh, I think, in value of about a $3 billion turnover industry uh, and is the major employer of, of people on the Gold Coast. And we need a resort city to make tourism work. Great, thanks, John. Um, I'm going to ask the, the panel a few questions with prompts, but um, we're really keen to open the questions to the floor as well. So um, get your thinking caps on about these questions and uh, I'll give you a few ground rules about how we'll field the questions as well. Kate. So, Thinking about the big picture, why is greenery important for lively, livable cities? Yeah, well, uh, Jed and I were talking about this just the other day, and we, we both came to the realisation that trees are the very one thing on the planet that connect the atmosphere to the earth, the soil. And there's, you know, the ground plane, we just look at everything at the ground plane and we see the trees emerging out of the ground plane. But what they, the role that they provide to the city doesn't have a value on it at the moment. And our society in general, in a capitalist society, we're good at valuing everything in a financial sense, in a dollar sense. But yet we don't value our green assets. So Kate, just yeah. on, in terms of the green assets, mm. um, thinking back to the um, urban tree canopy study that you were involved in, um, does Gold Coast need more trees? Uh, absolutely we do. Yeah, many other cities around Australia have already got an urban forest strategy. Um, they have percentage targets that, you know, that are anywhere between uh, sort of 30 to 40, some even up to 50% for certain other zones of their cities. Um, we're currently sitting at 32% of tree canopy cover across the whole of our urban footprint. Um, the good news is that actually increased from 27% in 2009. So the numbers are still overall going in the right direction, but um, as we know, it's very quickly for that to hit the slide uh, with certain types of development. So it's about keeping our eye on the numbers and now we've got the data, it's about how we make improved decisions across all of the 17 different sections of council that make decisions about trees. Wow, 17. Mm. Um, meanwhile, you've been you've looked at the entire urban footprint of the Gold Coast, and um, we sit between very green hinterland and the amazing Pacific Ocean, and so somewhere within that, um, we also have some really quite rich. Um, landscapes and biodiversity, but in terms of streets and neighbourhoods, how are our um, how are those streets faring when it comes to green cover and um, and green spaces? Yeah, well, well, the statistics are, are quite are quite surprising to a lot of people. Like, um, if we just look across that urban footprint that I mentioned, there's 23 different zones of the city that make up the urban footprint. And the three most substantial zoning in area size is um, the open space zone at 11%. Um, it's the medium density zone at 11%. And it's the low density zone at 19%. Now, in the low and medium density zoned land in the whole of the city, they're sitting at an average of about 21% tree canopy cover across those zones. So that's all the private, uh, privately owned land in the city. So 
our job in a policy sense is to say 21% is not enough to maintain a good ambient temperature of you know, where we walk and play. Um, there's, there's now measurements of urban heat island effects with the amount of bitumen, concrete and steel that we put everywhere. So it's about now recognising the role that the trees play to reduce the ambient and surface temperatures of the city and then being deliberate about making sure that things like deep planting provisions that are likely to hit uh, the road at some point in the next uh, year or two, making sure that there's no giveaways and no freebies and no relaxations on those sort of deep planting provisions. And that's the only way that that 21% is going to sustain or increase over time. The very interesting thing though, the last stat, is the high density zone of the city, which actually makes up only 1% of that total area, its tree canopy cover is still at 41% across that 1% of the city. So that's actually a really, really great figure. It's about making sure that that doesn't decline. That's a, a really interesting um, statistic. Um, <clears throat> the high density zone is pretty much what our, the topic of our conversation is tonight and um, I'm a resident of the high, high density zone so I'm just wondering how many of those trees are actually in the ground in uh, deep planting but that we'll move on to that later. Um, thinking about the uh, environment or the livability of a high density zone where a lot of people are um, pedestrians, what Jared um, makes attractive walkable streets? I guess it's uh Obviously the comfort factor through shade is a big help, particularly in summer, but also the active frontage. You want to be able to see other people, enjoy the experience, feel safe. And I think that um, safety, both in terms of vehicles and visibility, shade and comfort, and I guess a sense of place as well, yeah. feeling like you're somewhere, feeling like you're uh, enjoying that, what, what is livable about it, what's comfortable about it, what would make you come back to that space? So has it got identity? Yeah, so John, um, you're talking about um, our economy as a resort city. So why should we pay attention to the quality, or should we pay attention to the quality of uh, yes. streetscapes? Certainly, because if, you, if you're maintaining a tourism industry, uh, you've got to have an environment that will be attractive to the tourists. And we've always had this uh, extremely resort focus for our buildings um, matched with the ability to get to the beach, uh, use of the river, use of the canals. So we've built up a structure to cater to tourism and tourists very well and uh, our return visitors bear that out. We're reliant on massive return visitation to the city and we've got to do everything we can to protect that to make certain we've got mm. a livable, enjoyable city for both our residents and our tourists. So, John, as the localities with the tallest buildings absorb more and more tall buildings, what, are, what of um, uh, life at street level on the coastal strip? Uh, are the buildings we're designing uh, contributing to attractive green and walkable streets? Uh, Generally they are and have been. I think more and more we are designing and building buildings that are built more for permanent residents. Uh, and that's a trend that we have to watch because we need a stock for our, for our tourists to be able to uh, come and reside in them. Uh, and you have basic ingredients like pools, tennis courts, ambient areas. They do seem to be disappearing in our modern buildings uh, where we're not getting set back from the road any longer. Uh, we're not getting uh, street planting of trees, deep, deep planting. Um, and so we've got to watch how we go about having an attractive environment for, okay. so for tourism. Uh, let me just ask Greg a question then. So Greg, um, views, views and yield are the perennial drivers of intense development and um, podiums and perimeter blocks aren't new in Gold Coast um, high-rise centres, but what's changed? 
Uh, are we talking specifically about the high density centres of our city? Mm, yeah. Well, I think um, if I could just start by responding uh, to Kate's earlier comment about 40% of high density areas having landscape, I think it's part and parcel of the original planning scheme for Surface Paradise, which is the very rare gold book. It's worth its weight in gold, isn't it, Philip? <laughs> because it, it, it was very thin and it was very prescriptive about how uh, sites were to be amalgamated and the bonus was that you could get more of your building on top of the, uh, the land. So it encouraged people, developers, to buy neighbouring land and then put a smaller building on and go higher. Um, when I came here in 1980, I was fortunate to work with uh, an architect, John Mobs, in Main Beach, and um, he was very active in Tedder Avenue and with the local residents over there to get trees and things in the street, and that was an early one. And he also did quite a number of high-rise we did through the office. Um, and all these issues were debated at then, and, and the values at the time said it's really important if we're going high and getting dense that we have uh, shadowing issues considered. Uh, shadowing the beach was a big issue, but shadowing neighbours was even more important. Um, or, or not overshadowing them is, is what you... Uh, well, mean. considering the shadows that fall on neighbours, and if you have a big, massive block, um, what's on the north side of your property, then you're going to have shadow for much longer during the day, and you're better off with a, a, a small, narrow, tall building that has a less shadow impact on a neighbour to the south because that shadow passes very quickly and you're back in the sun again. Um, so those issues were embodied in um, a bunch of prescriptive regulations that guaranteed, underline that word guaranteed, a minimal amount of landscape on a site, particularly around the outside. So a lot of the earlier projects, of uh, high-rise projects on the Gold Coast were tall towers on, on, on large parcels of land and generated lots of landscape that's represented by Kate's figure. Um, the other thing about modern change is that um, the people are arguing when they do buildings, high-rise buildings now, that the amenity doesn't need to be included on the site. The amenity is actually the beach and the, and the neighbourhood and the ground level that people live around. In those days when they were attracting uh, tourists from south, um, they came up for a holiday and they wanted the, uh, the pools and the pool tables and the gyms and all those things on the site so they didn't have to go very far. Um, and then a lot of the developers realised that they weren't spending much time in those places anyway. The kids were. They were going to the beach and dream world and, and um, shopping centres and things like that. So the pressure was off to take away some of these amenities on the site. But as we've got uh, more and more dense and our streets have become more and more crowded, I think this amenity issue has got to come back into the equation. And, and one of my views is that people seem to have got over the, the height issue and keep adding more floors to towers and it seems to be a bit of a heroic challenge to get plot ratios up around 13 to 15 uh, and, and ignoring the ground level and I'm and I think most modern cities tell us a story that when they get more dense at ground level they get more open and in some of the best cities in the world in, in, in New York and some of the places where they have high density at ground level in London and that all the big buildings have two and three stories of um, open space, setback, and nothing. And all you get is a core and you get glass around the outside. And I think that, that fit, it handles that space at ground level so much better in, in that um, you're not being squeezed in with shop fronts selling tattoos. You've actually got a bit of elbow room around you and, and there's some big trees. And oh. it's hard to put big trees in the street, so you've really got to try and get it on the land. Right. And so me land. meanwhile, um, a couple of the um, new buildings that I've observed and also have seen um, the billboards for in my travels around the streets, um, they're not on large blocks and they seem to have a large storage of um, car parking garage above ground, so oh, yes, how you get that, that openness? It, yeah, well, the old, one of the old rules in the gold book was put all your cars underground so that the humans can live on the top, not the cars. Seems to make a lot of sense to me because we're coming here for a reason, to go on holidays, and it's not to stare at big car parks. And particularly since we have a light rail and we want to, want to be tourism in the middle of town, we want the light rail to support the tourists. And, and this change of having permanent residents in the middle of town. Um, they all seem to want two cars now. And, you know, we've gone through absurd situations mm. where we've, because the sites have got smaller, that we have these vertical storage machines that take cars up and down and then they 
one of the parts breaks down and it takes, because of COVID, nine months to get the car park accessible again. So I think we've got to rethink the cars in the middle of town. Um, and I've talked myself out of what I wanted to say. But yeah, I think okay. I <laughs> get um, carried so away with I'm, the detail. I'm sort of thinking um, the next question is for Jared and, and Kate. Now, anecdotally, I have heard, and I could be completely wrong about this, so I'm ready to be corrected, that there are already something like um, 250 um, new developments either in the pipeline or envisaged for um, that dense part of surfers and, and main beach. So um, if all of them follow the same kind of pattern that we're currently looking at for single developments, um, what kind of environment can we expect at, at street level for people based on those trends? Hostile, I'd, I'd say. <laughs> um, only because, you know, one of the things before we talked about was that activated frontage. And if that frontage is taken up by four storeys of car parking, there's very little opportunity for the people walking up and down the street to engage with that frontage. We're basically dealing, it was a subdivision not long ago in the 60s with small individual houses. And unfortunately, the larger parcels of land with the tower sitting in the landscape are rare and few and far between now. And we're now getting the tower on what was grandma and granddad's house block. So I think unfortunately, even in the heart of surface, you still have a lot of those small blocks with trees in the backyard. So possibly in those higher density areas, we may lose some of that percentage of tree cover through development. And I guess we don't have a lot of space in the street either. Uh, for trees or landscape, no space or setback for trees on the block. So, yeah, just harsh, hot, windy, um, not inviting, not how, good for a tourist, I wouldn't have sound? thought. Yeah, yeah. But you do rely on other spaces. It, it's not in isolation, you know, we do have the river, we do have parks, which are, are a godsend, but we run the risk of being dominated by a particular model of housing. And, and even above ground, we might even run the risk of um, losing those long distance views to the hinterland. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so maybe I could just try Yes, and... please do. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, we sh if we think about that ground plane again, as, as Jared's just mentioned, we've got you know, the, the transition between the street environment to the public space to the semi public space to the semi private space to the private space. And all of that kind of happens at that ground level. But if we just think about the street environment, one of the biggest, I guess, rock concerns from some of our uh, infrastructure engineers, we, we all know how bad the, the flooding and we all want our drainage systems to work. One of the biggest problems for them in the past has been the, the, the tree roots love finding water. It's what they do. So the water that they tend to find is in the drains under the under the road, and as soon as those drains become damaged, then we've got big infrastructure um, rebuild. So what we're trying to get the, um, the council projects to move to is to adopt the new technology, so around street uh, tree planting. So you've got silver cells and structural soil, root barriers, those type of things that have <coughs> never been used before on the Gold Coast. So it's also about choosing the right species of tree for the right location in a performance sense. So you'll have certain sizes of trees, you know they're only gonna be a small tree over time, a medium tree over time. You don't go planting a large tree over time in what is a very constrained urban environment. So we're all, I think the council as a whole is also getting uh, much more sophisticated about knowing the correct species of tree that's gonna perform the best over time. Uh, and that's gonna take time for those trees to grow, isn't it? Jerry and I were just talking before about the almost like the two speed economy of trees on the Gold Coast. We've got the really old growth trees that are still in the conservation areas, but then you've got a lot of new trees that have just been planted in the last sort of five to ten years. And then you almost have the missing middle of tree age, not a lot of the 80 and 90 and 100 year old trees. Mm. So that's another whole oh, interesting conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. The age of trees and the veteran trees and the roles that they play with hollows and the ecological function of those where, you know, um, still have nesting. 
So, Kate, are we more likely, just on that basis, more likely to see medium-sized trees rather than even the, you know, the tall pines that, um, for me, walking around the streets, give this really nice mediation between me and, and tall buildings, mm. for example? So are we more likely to see smaller trees in that scenario that you're talking uh, about? Well, no, well, I guess what I'm suggesting, Rosemary, is that in any one uh, spatial area of the city that's been looking, looked at from a budgetary sense, mm -hmm. um, all of those factors need to be considered about the type of tree, the amount of uh, canopy it actually provides. As we all know, Norfolk's are big and they're very structural and they're, they uh, perform a, a, a vertical... Um, you know, uh, blend between a high-rise building and the street level and a human level, but they don't necessarily provide an awesome shade coverage because mm. of the nature of their foliage. So, so I've yeah. been a, um, a very long-term advocate of um, overlapping canopies. That's that's my mantra: overlapping mm. canopies wherever we go. Is there is that a possibility? Is that the kind of streetscape that we could um, aspire to? Well, it, I think you should try and aspire to it. Unfortunately, a lot of the guidelines sort of say you have to be a certain distance apart for your trees. Um, sometimes there's a perception that they're too close together, but I agree, you know, plants in groups. And as Kate said before, maybe thinking of the tree not as your enemy in an urban setting, but your friend. And the systems that everyone's trying to separate, like water and stormwater, can we feed that back into the tree? Can it harvest the stuff that's on site? It is a pump. It's part of the water cycle. It's part of the carbon cycle. So it's this thing, this connection between the atmosphere and the ground. And it can still happen in an urban setting. I do think that we run the risk of having a, a medium-sized tree that fits the space. But that's where, in the middle of the city, we should be harvesting any opportunities for space that traffic islands or parks for the big old growth trees and investing in trees that might last 500 years or 1,000 years. And maybe we should look at where the old growth trees are in surface and say, hey, we need a succession plan for these things. We should care for our elders and, you know, look at the next phase because that... <laughs> John and I support you. <laughs> and, and, and it's it, it isn't static. Everything's changing. Yeah. Everything's moving. So you know what are we doing to protect this piece of infrastructure because it's worth something. This is really interesting in terms of what Greg was saying before about um, integrated systems thinking, but it's um, it's in a temporal sense as well. So it really needs to be in, in multiple dimensions thinking way ahead of not just the 10, 20, 30, 30 year um, horizon that we do um, strategic plans and regional plans in, but we really need to be thinking long term in terms of quality and yeah, quality of the environment. Because they, they last a long time, don't they? What's the oldest high rise on the Gold Coast? Is it 70 years old, 60, 60. years old? Not, King, not, that, not that old. We've got a, trees that are a lot older than that. Yeah. Mm. We've, 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 we've done a very good job on the beachfront. I go back to the early days in the Chamber of Commerce and the time when the erosion came in in 1968, 69, and took the Esplanade right away. Water was lapping up against the front uh, fence of the sands. The Esplanade had gone. Now, in time, we've built all that back out, and they've extended out into the beach uh, in reclaimed land, and we've got a great esplanade, a great uh, uh, area for tourists and locals. Every day you go there and you see thousands of people enjoying themselves on that beachfront. But unfortunately, as we come back, we haven't kept that standard up. As I've you come back from the beachfront? Come back from yeah, the beachfront, so into, yeah. the, into the side streets and down towards the highway. Uh, for good reason, but it's not necessarily making a livable area. I've noticed that in the last uh, month or two, uh, Council has planted probably a hundred banksias along the western side of the Esplanade, which is a great step 
and that sort of tree, I think, will mm. provide us with, they'll, they'll grow obviously close to the beach and they'll give canopy and shade. Uh, so that's a step. But unfortunately, when you look at what's happened, there are some areas along the Esplanade where they just can't plant because the buildings come too close to the right, footpath. Right up to the yeah. boundary. In fact, Ocean was the latest building we've got there. They stopped the planting. They didn't put any planting in front of Oceans because there's just no space. No space on the frontage because um, there are crossovers and... It's New York style. It's building right up to the footpath, wall to wall. So we've got to watch that, I think. Mm. It is an architectural problem because yes. the smaller the frontage, you still have to squeeze it down to fit double car garage access, transformer, um, emergency fire hoses and things like that, um, switchboards, garbage area, and humans can go down the side Maybe and squeeze into the building somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up with a lot of the smaller sites that have uh, huge buildings on now. The ground floor is completely obscures what's happening behind because of the concrete, and you can't plant trees in concrete. Is that right, Jerry? I can't. You can't plant trees in concrete. <laughs> yeah, look, it, it is a little bit hard, and it's everything that's under the ground as well, mm. because in our verges, we have, particularly in older suburbs like Surface Paradise, it's a spaghetti junction of services that are often not on the alignment that they're mapped on, uh, there's often redundant things underground and then over time new services come in and have to fit within this already constrained verge. So the space under the ground where the roots need to get down and spread are often unable to be planted because of gas, electricity, whatever it might be, and then you have overhead um, services as well. So there's limited space in what is the public realm to keep the pedestrian comfortable. Mm. Some of the best targets we've had is to actually plant in the road, to actually take out a car park and actually plant a tree in the pavement. There's not as many services, there's not as many mm. things to get in your way. Do people notice when a, a car park turns into a, a tree? It can, can be contentious when you lose a few car parks, but you know, over time, I guess we all have the benefit of that. But that's one of those other opportunities. Mm -hmm. Where can we yeah. uh, fit a tree in? And even its own, it might only be half a car park you have to take. Yeah. Very I, might just, I might just ask one more question before we open, open it to the floor. And um, this one is really for everyone. Uh, I might start um, with you, Kate, though. So should um, plantings on private land contribute to streetscapes in high-rise centres? Absolutely, yeah. And why? Why do you say that? And how? I think everybody's got a role to play. Um, yeah, I think uh, if we don't want to all keep running air conditioning units and whinge about the cost of electricity, um, you know, you need trees in cities to keep the city cool. So, uh, and every square metre of surface area is important. So there needs to be a mm. continuum from um, private to public in terms of green spaces? Uh, yeah, a continuum uh, for sure. So it'll, like I said, it'd be interesting to see um, how the architects or landscape architects or brilliant designers that are uh, designed to these deep planning provisions that will eventually um, be adopted in city plan It'll be interesting to see how the industry responds to those. Okay, can you tell us a bit more about these provisions that are coming up? Oh, well, they've been out in the public okay. arena now for, you know, the best part of four years, so, yeah, they'll, they'll be eventually adopted by council. Okay, mm. so how come it's taking so long? Well, how about I don't take up too much more time with that? And we can <laughs> some... <laughs> Just to be fair to the panel, trust me. I, I think it should... What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> A continuous... A, a continuum um, from... Private to public. Private to public yeah, or no, vice versa. Because oftentimes it's the narrow strip on the edge of your block. If you can add that into a narrow strip on the verge, suddenly you've got space. So I think it's being clever with the space we've got and tapping into that for a tree because that tree can then be an investment for 100 years. And it's a pretty low-cost investment. It's not... Um, no maintenance or carefree, but it's 
an investment in a hundred years of service that you can get out of that. I think it it makes the setting more friendly and appealing to everyone as well. Yeah, so it gives back a lot more for the investment. Then it takes away. Yeah, mm. Right. Yeah. So, Greg, um, do you have anything to add to that about the, about um, whether um, plantings on private land should contribute? Oh, to I streetscapes? think it, I think it's crucial. Um, I remember ringing a, a, a council guy in Sydney once just asking whether we could put a, a roof over a porch for a house. And I said it was in the six metre setback. He said, no, no way in the world. He said, that's ours. And, and in, in most of Sydney councils, they, the first six metres, you've really got to go to court to, to put any structure of your house in it because they own it. They have rules on fencing and everything. But in Queensland, I mean, you can build two metre high fences and close yourself off from the community completely with no rules. So our streets change character instantly. Um, and I think it's an example of why it's so important to be able to put landscape on private land because the public land is contributing to all of us and it's full of pipes and of all sorts, you know, gas and sewerage and water and, and stormwater. And, and then it's generally covered in bitumen and footpaths for people to move around. So it's very difficult to put landscape in, in streets, in, particularly in built up areas. So. It has to happen at ground level on private land and, and there is opportunity when we put car parks underneath rectangular sites. You put cars around the edge and every corner is, you can't put anything in there. And that, those corners should be able to get a little bit of land to put a tree and some of these smaller sites, at least one tree in each corner would be something. Um, and, and some of those corners should be filled in my mind with um, transformers and a, a better solution to access for emergency services and things like yeah. that because they do it in big cities why can't we do it here right, interesting. And, and these days you know developers see the ground floor as being most important for commercial but um, I, I think that the council can the council are making decisions to force developers to do something so we know it costs you well, why don't you have one more floor on the top because no one seems to worry about going up but you get more yield for the site so a bit more pressure to try and show how it's not going to cost developers money to do something which is good for the community. And it also makes the ground floor better. I think that there's, a, there's a subliminal message in the type of retail activity that's at ground level in surface. And that message is that it's losing its character that made it so attractive initially. And I think some of the shops that were there have moved to other places where there's a more, uh, much more amenity. And if we're going to go down and end up with Tattoo shops, I keep saying that, but I mean, there's, there's, there's scales of different development that gets returns per square metre. And when you see these sort of shops operating in the middle of surface, you know that it's very low value. And there's got to be better value for the public in those ground floor levels than there has been retail. Mm, interesting. Actually, I was just thinking about your um, uh, keeping the corners that, mm. that you can't park. So a, a car park six metres long. It means we've got a, a six by six mm. space and um, that is starting to sound quite attractive to me in terms of mm. what you could plant in there. Um, yeah. Car park access, transformer, everything <laughs> at ground level that's going in at present to argue against it. And, and the big thing about the planning scheme in, this, in Australia now, we're all performance based. We're not, you, you cannot under the Integrated Planning Act put something in for, to protect public and council's interest to make something like landscape mandatory. You, you, everything has got to be handled in guidelines that are interpreted by everyone and, and you can't force someone to plant a tree. So it's got to be interpreted and it's got to be seen as a really high value in the system. Okay, we'll talk about value soon. John, you wanted to... Well, uh, I'm not an expert in the, in the, in the trees and the in design, but I, as an interested observer and having seen the Surface Paradise uh, develop and become what it is. Uh, a couple of aspects that intrigue me is that Andy Stender's Central Plan Golden Book, um, when they built the Chevron and Aesons development, bring it back to our localised scene, uh, if you go up to that podium level, that is a most beautifully landscaped, enjoyable area for tourists and residents to live in. Uh, and yet you wouldn't know about it walking uh, Elkhorn Avenue or the highway, it's there and it's an amazing situation. Other examples, uh, the Moroccan building uh, that's got podium level and greenery, you don't see it from the road necessarily. Mm. So those places are there, but it, 
does trouble me in some of the newer buildings that um, I don't know whether it's just the greed or uh, the uh, ability of architects to put more and more on the site, but we're losing that perspective in our developments of greening along with producing a building. And uh, uh, I don't know whether there is ethics for architects to work to, to think about having a building that will be enjoyable uh, rather than just a living space stuck up in the sky. We might have to go back to that if council isn't going to be more insistent with its laws. I know the laws get tested in the courts and so forth, that's why they have to be strong and tough. But we might have to go back to being a bit more prescriptive uh, rather than leaving it up to the kind thoughts of the developer <laughs> to give you something. Yeah. Thanks, John. Look, um, I, I think there could be some um, questions from the floor. So hopefully you've been thinking about it. And I'd just like to uh, lay some ground rules for the questions. Um, so number one, always be respectful. I'm sure we've got a respectful audience here. Number two, check that your question is actually a question. And uh, if you're not sure, just check with your uh, neighbour before you ask it. And once you are certain that it is a question, then please raise your hand high and Jemima has a microphone. Wait for the microphone and um, then ask the, ask the question. So here's a question over here. And uh, there's one over there too. <laughs> Did you see another one here? And then, all right. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Uh-oh, they're going up everywhere. Can you keep, help me keep track? <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, my question relates to the... Oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, okay, if that dog. <laughs> my my question have... relates to the growing space beneath the trees, with the increasing density, growing population, and uh, increasing ownership um, of people in units, and the relaxation or the changes with um, people owning pets in apartments. We're seeing a lot more dogs in urban areas where there's a lot of hardscape, and particularly with um, so what's your question, assistance Elton? therapy dogs, they uh, and other dogs are trained to go on grass, and we're seeing um, public infrastructure in like railways um, introducing toileting areas for dogs, and I'm wondering what. Um, is happening in the Gold Coast in regard to those urban spaces, in regard to... Can anyone answer that? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know the answer to your question, because it's not something that's come to my attention yet. But um, we're happy to take your name and get back to you with some material, if that would be, if that would be okay. That sounds yeah. great. And especially those, Thank you. those 17 groups in council that make decisions about trees. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Hi, it's a question for Kate, I think. Oh, I yeah. think you mentioned something about the contained um, area for roots. So is that a new technology that's available and has been used in other cities around the world and is something that could be done? Because that sounded quite exciting, some new possibility, new types of um, root holding. And of course, I guess that um, does um, mean that there's a limit to the height that trees will grow. Yes. Well, I think any size tree is going to be better than no tree. So if that's what we need to convince the engineers who we need to work with, because uh, you know there's the push and pull of whose priority is, you know, the most important. Um, but in terms of the silver cell use that I mentioned, yeah, Vancouver particularly has implemented them very successfully. Um, and, and that there was a big project in, in their um, West End area around the harbour um, after the uh, last uh, the Winter Olympics in 20, 2010, and they used something like 5,000 silver cells throughout the area to get essentially like an urban forest to grow in what was previously a very uh, hard stand area. 
So, can yes. you give us a bit more of a description of what a silver cell is? Uh, I can do that. Okay, oh, great, Jen. So if you imagine you, you want to invest in a, in a really big hole for the tree and where you've got a lot of concrete or a highly urban area where you might need to drive cars over the top, uh, that can compact the root ball of a tree. So what you do is have a big hole and virtually have milk crates. That's what they're like. And you fill all the milk crates up with soil around the tree. And that get, then you can build a pavement over the top of the milk crates and that takes the load of the pavement. So you can just drive your cars and walk over the top, but the roots can get down through the milk crates too. So that's the easiest sort of analogy. Oh, that's one of them. Yeah, no. Yeah, pretty much the same type of product. Yeah, I, I would have thought anyway. Yeah. To be honest, I don't, I don't know. I thought they were called the silver cell, but um, yeah, we can check out what your strata cell is. Mm. Okay, we need the mic for questions. Um, right. Yes. Here's another question here. Uh, yeah, I suppose t tonight I've heard um, a lot of the issues about how difficult it is to make it happen, but the flip side is that you know anyone who's been to a city or a suburb or a street that is, you know, well greened. It's just a beautiful place to be, you know. It's it's something that we should all aspire to, and that's something we should try and make happen in our city. So, maybe my question is to Kate: Is you know what what are the what are the strategies that you're going to try and employ in the next you know one two three years to really get us on that path towards creating a green city here at the Gold Coast? Targets are the most important thing to have. Yeah. So, if we know that in road reserves across residential collector and residential access streets that there's currently 20% shade cover in there, and we say council agree to a target of 30%, then you've got something over five years that you're building towards, and every single project that gets funded needs to contribute. That's like a you know, 5,000 piece puzzle, and every project counts. So Kate, um, do we need to be a bit more ambitious with the targets? Or? Uh, let's just see if we can get anybody to agree to targets right. to start. <laughs> One step at a time. Just be a baby step. A baby yeah. step. Okay. Can I okay. add so, to yeah. that too? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Some of the other things that Brisbane City Council's doing with overhead services is they've negotiated with the service providers to bundle the services together. So that's a nice way of combining things together to enable trees to grow up and around and easily manage and maintain those services safely. So I think those sort of negotiations with the other authorities that we need to coordinate with can be done as well over time. Thanks, Jim. Just got a question. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, Thanks for the mic's over here, yeah. A um, wonderful discussion. Thank you to all speakers. Um, the architecture of most modern cities is pretty much the same world over but it's the landscape within those cities that gives identity because of climate and because of what will grow well in those areas. Some years back, about 1996 or, or 95 maybe, a lot of study was done and there was a, a couple of documents provided uh, the council created in terms of guiding the image of the city, a landscape strategy. That document has never been written into our current city plan and sits there as a potential reference if someone's interested as a bureaucrat to even bother to look at it. Regrettably, our park section, you know, they don't read. So unfortunately, we don't find that um, we get any reference to the differences of vegetation that could occur through all of the different areas of our city, from coast right through to hinterland, from the border to the north. And we've seen so much succulent sort of planting throughout the city as an endemic thing. And yes, there may be good reasons because it's of the drought tolerance of such species and, and, and planting. And Philip, your but question? are we going to see council uh, relook at, if you like, the nuances of different vegetation throughout the city to try to preserve what little, uh, I suppose, identity there might be that differentiates different parts of the city from one another? Who wants to take that question? What do, oh, yeah, for sure, Philip. I, I, I think that's... To be able to respond to your local setting is the best way of making sure that tree is going to survive in that location. We've got low-lying areas that might favour melaleucas. You've got elevated, rocky areas. The, the heart of surface used to be a rainforest. 
So we still have remnant rainforest trees in Surface Paradise and in some of the park areas in Cypress Avenue car park. So if we can look at those cues from what did grow there, we've probably got a good chance of re-establishing that vegetation. It may be challenging in those highly urban areas, but ensuring we can retain the pockets that exist now and build on them is a great way of preserving that character. Because it's not just the faceless high rises, it's the beachfront and it's the riverfront and the parks that front the river where we have still got the opportunities to build on that character. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Can I add to Jen? Yes, please do. Oh, thanks, Kate. Oh, Philip's, Philip, Philip's comment. Philip, there is an emerging, emerging understanding based on Jed's landscape character study of 2014 that the type of trees that need to be selected need to match the landscape, the geomorphology, the soil type, those sorts of things. So, for example, if you're in the foothills of the Gold Coast, you don't go and plant ma magnolias or little no, gems. I suppose my question that, is really, uh, it won't happen if we date. rely on just the goodwill of either the park section and council or developers. We have to enshrine this as part of a legislative sort of tool. So my question is, is anything happening yes. or are we just going to wait yes, for decades? Yes, there is, some, there is some things happening. My question sort of followed on a little bit from Phillips about the sense of place and landscape when you are in a different city. And I always notice when I land back into the Gold Coast and you're driving up the Gold Coast Highway, there is nothing that welcomes you to paradise. As the light rail is extended through our city, it's forming a great big concrete scar. And while we may need good public transport, alongside that, we've lost some of the best large trees in our city. And they haven't been replanted um, or replaced along the way. And I think in the newspaper today, there was uh, something again about the trees at Miami. We're now about to lose all those Norfolks in the middle of the Gold Coast Highway there. What is being done to give the Gold Coast a sense of place to people who land here and let them know that they've arrived in paradise? I think the answer to that's nothing right now. Nothing. Well, it sounds like nothing, doesn't it? Like, I, I haven't seen any projects that have come out to say what you've just suggested then, but it's, it's a very worthy statement to make. Well, the Just yeah. destination Gold Coast? No, the organisation doesn't have an involvement in that area, but again, as an observer, uh, I think if we relied on the native flora of the city, we wouldn't have as an attractive tourist place as we've got. And so many years ago, we started going into the area of palms. And whilst palms probably grow very well here, and they do grow very well here, they weren't part of the native vegetation of surface paradise, for instance. So now you see uh, the palm trees on the streets of surfers that are brought in at great expense to the developers, and that presents a bit of a tourist aspect to the to the to the surfers paradise area. Um, however, you've got to match that with other things that will grow. I mean, I remember Orchid Avenue when it was a, an entire street of hibiscus trees, hibiscus plants, and people would just walk down Orchid Avenue and pick a hibiscus and put in their hair, but it wasn't native. Uh, so I think there's room to integrate native and introduce flora and fauna to make the city an attractive I think tourist if you use Singapore as an example, everyone that goes to Singapore, I think, is, is in wonderment of the landscape architecture mm. that is in that city. Mm. Why aren't we learning from places like that and making the Gold Coast something really spe spectacular? Because we have all the ingredients here to make mm. that happen. That's right. I remember um, the first time I visited Singapore in the 1980s, it was a very hot and dusty place and now very green. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Is there one more burning question? Um, it's almost... <laughs> is that, yeah, you've had... Yes. Uh, I just was wondering if um, there's a place for um, utilising vertical gardens, particularly on older style high-rise high density, will it, are they effective in cooling the building and or providing shade and just general appearance, making things a bit greener and a bit more oxygen amongst the concrete? Oh, for sure. They, they make, in my opinion, they provide a service. 
I guess um, I've always been a little sceptical about them only because of the amount of infrastructure that's needed to support that particular structure, the maintenance upkeep over a number of years. If, if I was saying, if your preference was a tree or a vertical garden, I'd go for the tree first. Because I, but I do see a role for vine arbors and green walls and all those sort of things, particularly in tight spaces. So it is a horses for courses and they do have a value. But we want to make sure that uh, they're not used as an alternative uh, to trees, because I think that where we can fit a tree in, we'll have a much longer life cycle uh, with much less cost and human input to keep that thing alive, yeah. in, in my opinion. Great. Thank you very Could, much. There was a lady here that had asked a question. We'll put a hand up right at the start. I, I need to leave space for your pithy comments at the end. Oh, I'm happy to do that. I'm not just taking up the After, um, when we finish, because uh, we did have a, an advertised time, um, the bar will be open and everyone will be able to um, speak to the panellists informally. So um, we're, we're just about out of time. I'd like to actually um, go to the, the heart of um, the question of the topic that I asked at the beginning um, for the final question. Will the Gold Coast become just another hot and heartless concrete jungle? Um, what can be done to ensure that there's space for life on the streets? That's people and trees in the future high-rise city. So just a, um, a pithy and um, take-home action comment. John? <laughs> Starting with John. <laughs> uh, well, I think that there, there, there is room for uh, inventiveness and incentiveness. And I think that uh, we have side streets between the Esplanade and the highway and, the, and Fernie Avenue. They could, in some places, be made one-way streets, cut down a lane of traffic and use the extra lane for pedestrian interesting greenery. That's one idea. Um, I think that we, we can look to maintaining better parks in and around Surface Paradise. Surface Paradise has very, very few parks. In fact, I remember when the Surface Paradise State School uh, existed and the state government took it away to, sh to Isle of Capri, that area could have been a park, but instead right, so they sold it for a hotel development. Yeah, so as we want incentiveness and inventiveness and incentiveness and long-term thinking. Yeah, give incentives to the developer. If you, if you give them an extra height to the building, an extra level or two, you can perhaps take back some of the land for greenery down below. Greg. I think the value of landscape in the city is placed far too low in the strategic planning. I think it should be raised right to the top and I think the examples over here of, of arrival, um, is, it's, it's a crime that we, we actually present our city this way. And I think Singapore survived and, and its whole status as a, an attractive city has risen because it had landscape right at the top of the agenda. And I think unless we get that and we invent some sort of uh, meaningful legislation that requires this to happen, then I think we're going to be left up to subjective assessment of weeds. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> did you want to just uh, mention, you did talk to me earlier about a safety net. Uh, a safety net. You want to say that? You get carried that? away. <laughs> 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 um, well, I think, I think yeah, I, uh, it goes back to this uh, prescriptive approach of making sure that we do achieve a bit of landscape on a block of land, particularly in urban areas that are high, high visual, high visitation of our visitors. Um, I think we need to make sure that this safety net in the city planning is a minimum guaranteed few square metres of landscape of road frontage. And um, if, if you can't achieve the deep planting there, then I think there are many ways to provide giant pot plants with your super gold and silver cell things that you've got to, to maintain large trees in the middle of town. I think you can do that, but you've got to have the space okay, on so private land at ground level to achieve that. And yeah. that's the safety net to guarantee landscape. Safety net and guarantee. Jared. All right. I, 
I think that the Gold Coast needs to realise that its character isn't all high-rise, that the high-rise spine is a unique part of the city and iconic in its own right at this end, but the unique other parts of the city, the identity of the city, needs to respond to those settings and we run the risk of dominating the city with a monoculture of a particular building type right along the coast and that will cruel anything that's left. We can see how we're losing key views to key ridges through high-rise development. We're not responding to the local setting. We're rolling out a model of architecture that's actually different to the model that Surface was originally based on and squeezing that into smaller blocks with no room for green. So it's the form of construction and the dominance of that that will cruel the city and it's already half gone. So what's our action? Plan? The action is to moderate that form of development and start responding to the values of place and making sure that we're not losing those values because once you can't see a ridge, that doesn't come back. And it's a simple thing from public places. And that is what creates the identity of the city, this setting, this ridge lines to the sea. So I think we, we will continue to try and put lipstick on the gorilla that is the built form of the city. And that's all it will be. It'll still be a pig. So that's, a pig. So unless the city <laughs> plan turns around and responds to the setting, we will lose any value in the city. Hmm. Kate, what can you say? I've got a Joni Mitchell song running through my head. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what you, know you got till it's gone. gone. <laughs> uh, look, you know, we spend millions of dollars on, well, to take Mona's point, public art at the entrance to the Gold Coast that I'm not even sure anybody recognises a GC symbol, but, you know, plants are, are memorable, trees are memorable, you know, they, they, they frame things and... Um, yeah, look, uh, I think we've got reason to be optimistic with some of those figures that I showed you. It's not all doom and gloom for the Gold Coast, but there is an opportunity uh, with um, improved communication and collaboration across those 17 sections of council that I said have a touch point with trees. Um, when everybody's singing from the same song sheet, ideally, you will see the improvements that we all need to make the city a world-class city. Yeah, and what I'm hearing is that um, regulation is the way to go. It's the only thing that's ever going to get anything done. There in another, attitude. Another thought I had, Rosemary, and that is that the council has a green levy in everyone's rates, and that's used by council to provide green areas. I think they've been concentrating too far on being in the hinterland and away from the established areas. If you use some of that green levy today to preserve parts of surface paradise, it would probably provide a much better return on the money than we're getting by buying acreage further out and keeping the trees. So that's just a thought. Yeah, we okay. could go in another direction. On that note, we'll um, finish and say thank you to the panel. Um, please show your appreciation with a, a round of applause. And I just want to say that um, we've recorded this event and all the other events, so you can go back and have a listen um, to some of the, the really um, excellent suggestions that have come up through the panel tonight. Thank you, Dr. Rosie Kennedy, and thank you to all the panellists tonight for a really intriguing session. Um, what I heard was identity, amenity, activation and place, and I think they are four really key words to... Um, be discussing it again tonight. Thank you also to the audience. What captivating and um, interesting questions, and I apologise, I couldn't get round to all of them, but it was obviously um, uh, an, an indication of just how passionate you all are here tonight. Thank you also to the Gold Coast Open House Committee for organising such an event, um, and also to Hoda for allowing us to use your wonderful space. Um, so please stay on and join us for a drink at the cash bar at the rear of this venue. But before we go, this Sunday, 16th of October, there's Ask an Architect where there's three free 20-minute one-on-one consultations with these 
fabulous six architects here on your screen. So please book online. I think there's still some very rare limited spaces available. A sustainable design Q&A with Ben Sinclair, designer of Corner Block, on Saturday and Sunday, the 16th of October. And our documentary screening and panel, Yana Yana Yiba, on Sunday, the 16th of October, here at Hot R3 to 4.30pm. And before you go, all of these are available on our app, and we also have a very limited tote bag um, for purchase at the rear of the uh, room if you'd like to do that. So thank you all, and uh, please thank the panellists once again. <laughs>